question? Just a second. <laughs> um, OK, welcome, everyone, to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangout. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And happy to help answer your questions, the questions that got submitted, or from the people here live in the room. Uh, Danny, do you want to go ahead? Yes. OK, thanks for having me on. Long time viewer, first time participant. <laughs> Uh, my question is about URL parameters in the Webmaster Tools and the difference between two particular options. Um, and uh, I was wondering if I could do a screen share to, to show them. Is that possible in this? Sure. OK. OK. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Yeah. Uh, URL parameters? Mm -hmm. OK, so my question is the difference between no doesn't affect page content and yes, but don't crawl any URLs, this last radio option. Does that um. have the same effect, ultimately? So I, I think I, I'd have to double check. But uh, from what I recall from when we set this up initially, uh, the option where you say doesn't affect page content essentially says we can pick one of these URLs and just crawl it like that, whereas the uh, radio button on the bottom says no URLs basically means we don't crawl any URLs that have these parameters. So it's kind of the difference between crawling one or crawling none of them. OK, my goal here is actually related to mobile. On my mobile site, I have separate mobile and separate desktop. And on my mobile site, um, I have a link at the bottom of each page to the full site. And the way that it works is it adds a, a URL parameter of mobile equals no. Mm -hmm. And through the PHP get method, it creates a, a session. And, and it forces to show the desktop um, e each time the user loads a new page on their phone. And what's that created now for the first time as a webmaster for me is two versions of each page when I do um, a site colon search in Google. Okay. Does that make sense so far? What I would do there is more to use a rel canonical than the URL parameter handling here. I, you could probably do something similar with the URL parameter tool, but I'd have to. Because so far, I experimented with the no option for yeah. about three months. I left it on no, and it didn't change the results when I did a site colon search. Yeah. So, so just recently, uh, I changed to yes. Um, I changed. Am I still? Are you still hearing me? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Recently, I changed to yes, no URLs for the past week or two, and it still hasn't changed the site colon search results. Yeah. So the URL parameter handling tool primarily handles how we crawl the page. So it's not something where we would directly change what we have indexed based on that, but over time we would change what we have indexed. So. That's something where I imagine if you do a site colon query, you'll see the changes there over a couple of months, not specifically not within a couple of weeks. But I've heard you before in these Hangouts say that sometimes that, that, um, that the site colon search might even reflect two versions of the page, even though Google's index is only going to pick one for SERPs. Yeah. Do you think that's going to be the case here? Are you even if I get this, even if I do, even if I choose the right option in the URL parameter tools, um, possibly, possibly. It depends on what kind of a query you do. If you do a generic site colon query for your website, then we'll probably primarily show the ones that we think are relevant for your site. Whereas if you do a site colon query and then in URL mobile equals zero or something like that, then that's something where we probably try to pull out those URLs even if we're not showing them as index. And what you can do in, in a case like that to double check is to do an info query. So you do info colon and then the full URL. 
and you see which URL we actually index there. And that's generally a, a rough way to double check which one we're actually picking for indexing. Okay, that's the first time I've heard of info doc, uh, info colon. Um, it, if I used, and I've heard you before say that the rel canonical tool, even though it may still show two versions of the site in a site colon search, is that correct? Yes, that can happen too. Yeah, and that's not something you really need to worry about. For a normal website, if we crawl like a, a a double version of your website, that's not something that's going to significantly change things for your website. Whereas if you have like 10 different copies or 100 different copies of the same content, that's something where it'll be harder and harder to crawl that content. So if you're just talking about mobile equals zero and not mobile equals zero, then that's not something I, I'd really lose any sleep over or try to find some complicated solution for that. I mean, webmasters must deal with this every day, especially for e-commerce companies where they have uh, filtering and yeah. they u use URL parameters. Um, what, which, which, which one would, should they pick? Should they pick no, or should they pick um, yes, no URLs? Or do you want to research it offline and get back? Uh, that probably depends a bit on what they're trying to do there. Uh, some kind of filtering where you have like strong category pages, for example, that's something where maybe you want to have those pages indexed separately. Other kinds of filtering, you're basically creating an endless list of URLs that can be followed, and that's the kind of thing you don't want to have crawled separately. So it, it kind of depends on which direction you want to go there. So if you, if that if that e-commerce webmaster did not want them um, indexed, would he would he or she choose um, Yes, no URLs, or would he or she choose no doesn't affect page content? Um, I use yes because it's different content. When we crawl the pages to double check, that's something where we kind of see that there is different content already, and then use uh, the option no on the bottom to say, well, this isn't something that you should be crawling. Okay. And um, And this is something we generally try to figure out ourselves. So if you have the, the option like let Googlebot decide and this is something you're really not sure about, then I just leave it at that and let it get indexed like that. If we see that it leads to exactly the same content, then that's something where we'll fold those URLs together and treat them as one URL anyway. Yeah, because in my mind, when I think of a mobile equals no or some sort of affiliate, it, 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 it's more of like an affiliate tracking code, right, that shouldn't affect page content. Exactly. Do you agree? Yes. So it would seem like the natural answer would be no, doesn't affect page content, because it says select this option if this parameter can be set to any value without changing the page content. Exactly, yeah. Okay, but it hasn't worked for me in three months. <laughs> that I've left it up. Should um, I wait longer, or should I switch to yes, no URL? I, I just leave it like that. I, I wouldn't worry about that. If it's really just like one parameter and it's like zero or one, then okay. I just leave it like that. It's not going to cause any problems for your site. Okay. Thanks very much. I'll sure. bounce off so somebody else can enter. All right. Hi, Thanks. How are you? Hey, Baruch. Uh, I got a quick uh, mobile question, and yeah, I had to do that. You know, I had to do that. So uh, I've uh, corrected uh, about 300 pages, and I'm kind of worried uh, with one area where, you know, how you can mark as fixed, right? So I have to go back, I have to double check and triple check, make sure that the uh, pages have been uh, correctly uh, working on mobile friendly tests. So. Uh, I wanted to know. So, is this okay if it's if it was launched? It was launched yesterday. Everything was corrected yesterday, and today the update. Um, is that a problem? Will it affect uh, the ranking. That sounds bad. Yeah. Yeah, I think you should be okay. <laughs> uh, we right. just we just published a blog post or two blog posts actually. Um, you probably aren't seeing this because you're in the Hangout here. So if you want to read all the news, go read that. But uh, we basically have that question covered in the blog post. Like, I just made a whole bunch of changes across my website. What should I do now? 
And it mentions different things there. It's like uh, the fetches Google and submit to indexing can kind of help, as well as setting up a sitemap file and saying all of these pages have just recently changed, and Googlebot will go off and crawl those pages again. So those are essentially the, the main options there, where you can tell us this content changed, and we should take a look at it as quickly as possible so that we can take its current state into account. But the thing is, John, uh, the errors are from, like, March. You know, some of them are, like, from March, but they've that's been... Fine. Yeah, I mean, that's not something you really need to worry about. That's essentially the, the way Webmaster Tools aggregates the data there, and that doesn't mean that those pages are seen as bad at the moment. And that's something where I do more like a, a site colon query or search for some text on that page and see if it has a mobile-friendly snippet or not. Yeah. And if it doesn't have it, and I'm guessing if you uploaded the website yesterday, then a lot of the pages won't have it yet. That's completely natural. That just takes kind of time to recrawl and reprocess everything so that we have the, the new state. OK. All right, thank you so much. All right, let me grab some questions from the Q&A, and then we can get back to more from you all. Um, following a domain migration to a new domain, some pages that never existed on the old domain are appearing in the search results as pages from the old domain. All links uh, lead to the new domain. Do you know why this might be happening? This is kind of similar to what we mentioned before. If you do an explicit site colon query for a site that actually moved to a different domain, then we'll understand that those URLs were also on that old domain, and we'll show them to you if you explicitly look for them. So that's something where if you look for the old URLs, we'll try to be helpful and say, well, here are a bunch of these old URLs, even if, though we already know that these actually move to a new domain in the meantime. So that's not something I'd, I'd really worry about there. This is essentially just the way our algorithms are working. Uh, you can follow the process of a site migration more in the index status information in Webmaster Tools, where you see for the old domain that the counts are going down, and for the new domain, the counts should be going up. And if you see that happening, that's essentially a sign that things are working properly. Another thing you can track is in sitemaps, the indexed URL count, where you see explicitly for the URLs that you submitted to us, which of these are actually indexed. And if you do that for the new domain, you'll see across your sitemap files, if you have multiples of them, which ones are getting indexed and how much. Um, for product listing pages on our site that are mobile friendly, Google is showing products one through X of Y tag instead of the mobile friendly tag in the search results. Um, we looked at that a bit, and we're trying to figure out what we can do there to also show the mobile friendly tag there. So that's something where we're trying to make sure that we have the best of both worlds, because both of these kind of snippets add value for the user. And we just want to make sure that we're providing the right things to use at the right time. So I imagine that'll change at some point, but I don't have any uh, confirmation that it'll happen or any time frame when that might happen. Uh, does Google apply sandbox effect also on old domains? This would be a big learning for e-commerce SEO, if you can answer this question. Um, I took a quick look at the question in the forum. And it looks like there are a whole bunch of changes made on this website. And of course, if you make a whole bunch of changes on a website, then that's something that's going to take a while to be processed and kind of taken into account again. And depending on what kind of changes you make, those changes might result in a higher ranking or higher visibility of your website, or they might result in a lower visibility of your website over time. So that's not something where I'd say just because you have an old domain, you're automatically always ranking number one for those queries. We really try to take the relevance of these pages into account when it comes to our ranking. Um, Let's see, would you give me some hint about the next Panda update or refresh? Some industry folks are guessing it would come after the mobile-friendly ranking algorithm in May. Uh, should I believe their predictions? I guess if these industry experts uh, know this kind of information, maybe they can also give you some lottery numbers, because they probably know a little bit more than we do here at Google. So that's something where I wouldn't necessarily take their 
uh, advice into account for, for these kind of things because we, we work on these updates and it's not that it's something where we'd say, well, we have this planned and we're going to leak it to some industry experts and they'll know about this before everyone else. We really try to figure out when the best time is to make these updates and sometimes we have to work incrementally, step by step, and figure things out along the way. Other times, we have different teams that are working in parallel that are trying to come to a solution essentially at the same time. So that's not something where you have to wait one thing for the next thing to happen all the time. Uh, that said, I don't have any dates or any updates on the next Panda update, so I don't have anything uh, specific to pass along at the moment. It might be that it happens in May. It might be that it happens later. I don't have any confirmation there. Uh, go ahead, Brett. Uh, go hey, ahead. Uh, John. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Greg. Uh, hey there. Uh, you sent you a message on Google+. Plus. I know it's not the easiest message in the world, but I'm just wondering if you can possibly get a chance to reply. It would really help us out a lot. Sure. I took a quick look at it today. I just got back today, but I haven't drafted anything up. Uh, I guess in general, if you run across something that's that's really weird that you can't figure out, you're welcome to send it to me, but uh, I can't guarantee that I can get you an answer quickly. Um, but I noticed your post, so I, I'll try to see if I can bring you something there. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, hey, John, since we're still talking about penalties, uh, I got a, you mentioned in the past that uh, a website can be both uh, uh, penalized from uh, web scan algorithms such as Penguin, and at the same time have uh, have a manual action in webmaster tools for the same, more or less the same reason, like spammy links. Um, and uh, uh, we've got a client uh, that came to us uh, about a year ago with a manual action, and uh, we went ahead and uh, went through the whole process of disavowing the links. Uh, removing what we could, send a re reconsideration request, and uh, within a few weeks we uh, we got the penalty removed. Uh, now, uh, so uh, last week, for example, uh, uh, the same person came again and uh, told me that indeed there's no manual action appearing in webmaster tools, but the results haven't really improved, especially in organic traffic. Uh, this is actually the website. Uh, so I was wondering whether it is the case that there might be several penalties stacked. And uh, they asked me, actually, if they should move to an entire new domain and like start it clean and um, if they have that option. Yeah. So if there's a manual action, they will still see that in the manual actions uh, part in Webmaster Tools. So if they have multiple manual actions, they'll see the multiple listings there. Uh, that's something where they should see that directly in, in the manual action section, if there's something like a penalty still applying. Uh, when it comes to our algorithms, of course, they can pick up sim similar things as well. And depending on when they were doing the, these kind of uh, link issues that you mentioned, uh, that's something that might be taken into account there. And that might be something that has a really strong effect on this website because I don't know, maybe they were doing it for years and years and years and years, and their algorithms have been kind of piling that on over the time and saying, well, this is something we really have to be careful with. So whether or not they need to move to a different domain or not is, is really hard to say for me. But it's something where you, with your experience, might be able to look at that and say, well, there's just like so much cruft that was happening here with this old domain that it really makes sense to start over with a new website. And that's something where I, I can't really say you should do it like this or you should do it like that. That's something you kind of have to work out on your own and figure out how much time does it really take to build a new website or how easily could I switch to a new website versus how strongly we're actually attached to this website. So if you're a brand and you've been working on your website for a decade or longer, then you're not just going to switch to like V2 domain name and say, well, everything is on a different domain. Uh, it's a lot harder. So that's something where you kind of have to take your experience and give them kind of soft advice that is really hard to uh, turn into something technically correct or technically incorrect. 
Uh, right. I was wondering mostly since uh, when we did the uh, so last year when we did the whole reconsideration request and removed the manual action, they haven't received it. So they had just one manual action regarding the, the links. Uh, we have it revoked, but when we when we did that and removed the links and uploaded what we couldn't remove in the disallow file, they only had left like I don't know five percent like original natural quality links. So I was wondering they didn't have uh, any further results because they didn't have anything good left really, or there's just another penalty like a penguin penalty that they're also under on and uh, that kind of breaks their efforts to move up. I would guess based on your like they have 5% of the links left comment that it's a combination of both. Where oh. there is very little support left because almost everything that existed was problematic and at the same time our algorithms have picked up a lot of problematic things so it's Probably a combination of both of those. So moving to a new domain might be a good idea if they can do this from a brand perspective. And uh, I would perhaps look into that, but at the same time, I think you need to make sure that they don't go down this road again, so that they don't just like keep rumbling through one domain after another, because that doesn't really make sense for anyone. Of course, yeah, they they, they can back right now and are looking forward to, to working with us, but. Uh, we just wanted to know that any effort that we do uh, uh, when working with them isn't going to be um, like uh, stopped by the fact that they still have something uh, going on behind the scenes yeah. in an automated fashion. OK, cool. Thank you. OK. OK, um, I got referral spam traffic in my Google Analytics. Usual, users usually come from Russia. Is Google doing something about this? Um, I know this is something that the analytics team have, has heard about before. I don't know what, what they're currently doing about this. So you're not alone. There are people that have been sharing blacklists that you can set up for analytics. And I don't think it's uh, specific to Russian users, so it probably doesn't make sense to like block individual countries. But uh, there's just referral spam happening, and this is essentially an old school type of spamming that they're just doing with analytics now. Um, if I don't have a mobile friendly, mobile optimized website, is it possible that Google de-indexes me in mobile, but in desktop it doesn't? Also, how can Google suggest me in desktop search, but if someone searches for mobile it doesn't? So, first of all, we don't remove websites for not being mobile friendly. Our algorithms essentially demote them slightly and uh, promote them if they are mobile friendly, of course. So this is something where we don't remove those websites completely. And if someone is searching explicitly for you, then we'll know that your website is really the most relevant for that search term, and we'll show it anyway. So it's not that your website is going to disappear completely from mobile. But if we, of course, have different options available for us, and we see some of these are mobile friendly, and some of those are not mobile friendly, and they're all kind of similar in relevance, then probably we'll be showing the mobile friendly results to users who are on smartphones. So not on desktop, but specifically to the users that would profit from seeing something that they can actually look at on their phone. What do you mean by slightly? Um, slightly. If everybody's got the mobile friendly tag, uh, the first, second, third page, so does that mean the site would end up on the fourth page? Um, I don't think it would work out quite that well or quite that, that strongly. I mean, it, it's something where when we look at the motions, we essentially move things down a little bit or make it less, uh, have less weight in the search results. So it's not that we'll like, count the search results places and say, oh, everyone will go back 30 places. Uh, so that's not something where you can say, well, it'll always be on page four if all the other results are mobile friendly. OK, wow. Wait and see. Uh, this is rolling out over the course of a week or two. So it's not that you would see it like jump over today, but uh, you'll probably see it, I guess, if you're watching the search results for a site over the course of the next week or so, you should see that kind of a change there. By the way, John, is it more of a 
a boost that websites with mobile friendly um, pages get or more of a demotion for the sites that don't um, they're kind of both equivalent, right? If you boost one side, then the other side kind of goes down. We can't put like 12 results on page one. Uh, so if we put two new ones in there, we have to take two out and put them on page two. Right. I was wondering whether it's like uh, a web spam algorithm, for example, which actually demotes the websites rather than just pulling up other websites. No, it's, I mean, it's, it's not a web spam algorithm. So it's. We're not looking for something bad and kind of penalizing people for this. We're trying to make sure that we have the relevant and useful results for users available. And that means kind of bubbling those good ones up. Right. So it's it's more like the SSL uh, type of update that went to that year? No, no, no. Kind of similar to that, yeah. I mean, it's definitely a stronger effect. So it's not exactly comparable, but it's it's kind of similar in that regard. Okay. Oh, wow. OK. But I mean, again, it's uh, it's always essentially equivalent the way when you look at it. If you boost some up, you have to take some down. So it's not, not the case that we would say, well, there's a big difference if you demoted some or if you promoted some others. But the impact is higher. That's all, John, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have some of that, I think, in the blog post. So yeah. I'd. Take a look at that after the Hangout. Um, how many words of content minimum are required on a single page? Uh, there's no minimum, no maximum. You can put whatever you want, essentially, on the page. Uh, from our point of view, it makes sense that there's unique, compelling, and high-quality content on there. And sometimes that means a lot of text. Sometimes that means you don't need that much text. So it's not that there's any magic number out there that you need to aim for. I think this goes into the next question here. How many outbound links can we add in a 500-word article? You can put as many as you want there, as many as you think are relevant. I think, uh, what was it? Matt Cutts did a blog post where he linked every word in a blog post, pointing to something else. So that's you can do that if you want. It probably doesn't make that much sense for a user, but kind of find out what makes sense, what works for your content. By the way, uh, is it true that uh, when you write an in-depth article and you link your sources and other relevant uh, pages from the internet to model websites is actually helpful and Google is uh, kind of expecting this to happen? Um, I don't think so. Because, like, when you, for example, when you link to a to a spammy website, you kind of get some of the effect that on you as well. So I was wondering if that's mm -hmm. the other way around, like linking to a high authority website, like your source or something like that, is kind of beneficial to you if you know it's done organically. You know? I mean, there, there's no magic SEO benefit of linking to high quality sites. That's something that I think spammers tried out, I don't know, 10 years ago, where they would make these really spammy pages, and on the bottom they'd link to Wikipedia and say, well, you know, this is a high quality link, therefore my content must be high quality. And that's, that's not the way that we look at it. So that's something where we, we try to take the whole page into account as it comes, but uh, it's not that there's any magic advantage of having a high-quality high link on the bottom of the page. OK, not magic, but. <laughs> I mean, for, for the users, obviously, it, it can provide a lot of value. And that's something that indirectly might, might make sense for a website. If you're really providing something valuable for a user that they can kind of use as a research source, then maybe they'll link to your page as well and say, well, this page links to all the right resources. Uh, just go here and get that information. And that's kind of indirectly you get that advantage. But it's not a direct SEO advantage where I'd say, well, you get a boost in your rankings like this little bit uh, because you're linking to Wikipedia. I, I don't think that would really make sense. Uh, but would Google use those links or the, the content on the pages that these links lead to to better understand, for example, if they're not sure, if Google is not sure uh, what the content is about on a page, might it visit some of the external links to try to figure that out? That's theoretically possible. I think that 
could happen in some situations, but at the same time, if we really don't know what your page is about, then that's a bigger problem, I think. So if you're no, I mean, writing at the beginning, when you just first start indexing it, and maybe it takes some time, as far as I know, to kind of understand exactly where the page should be situated. I think even then we'd have to take a look at the content first and understand the content first. So if you're writing a page called golf, and we look at that page, and we don't know is this about the car or about the sport, then based on the content alone, if we can't figure that out, then that's kind of a bad sign already. And that's not something you can kind of override by just having this one link to, I don't know, the, the golf car homepage. Right. So that's kind of something where you really need to make sure that the relevance is provided on your site first, and then that additional information, I don't know, it's possible that there's like a small aspect there that we take that into account. But I wouldn't rely on that. It's not something I'd say, well, this fixes the problems that I have otherwise in my website. Right, right. Just I was asking mostly because some people uh, think that they should actually avoid linking to other websites, so they kind of hog their page rank or whatever uh, people used to think in the past. Yes. I, I think that's something where you really need to work with your users. That's not something where I'd say there's a primary SEO part there. I'd really think about the users and make sure that they're able to use your site properly. John, I actually have a follow-up to that question. Sure. Uh, last week, we previously had no followed all of our links uh, going to external sites, and we decided to add uh, to remove the no follow tag. And we immediately started receiving these link removal requests. Um, they seem pretty automated. Um, I guess someone who's been, you know, going through some sort of spam attack has been contacting like every site. I'm not sure if the other you know, participants in this hangout have dealt with that, but what do you do when someone says, can you remove remove our link, and yet it's a high-quality link that we're using as a reference? Um, I think that's up to you. I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't necessarily worry too much about that. If that's really a normal link that you have on your page and you see, well, this is something I really want to keep on, my, on your page, and maybe it makes sense to keep it. I think in the worst case, the other side can always disavow that link if they want to. Um, on the other hand, if you're looking at that and you say, well, I don't know, I don't really need this link here, and these guys seem pretty upset, maybe I'll just take it down and, um, I don't know, do them a favor. It, we've we've gone back to no following the links, but I mean, if we didn't do that and we kept them as do follow and they were, you know, let's say we had X amount of people adding us to a disavow file, does that negatively impact our trust no. with Google? No. OK. That's, that's fine. I mean, that's something that sometimes happens. For example, maybe you have a blog, and in the comments, someone managed to drop, com drop a bunch of comments spam, and those sites are now using the disavow tool to kind of clean that up. It doesn't mean that the rest of your content is really bad. It's just, well, someone managed to drop a bunch of comment spam on your blog, and you didn't notice that. So it, it kind of got picked up like that. So that's something where just because people are putting in your disavow file isn't necessarily bad. On the other hand, it probably makes sense to kind of keep a healthy relationship with the people that you're working with, especially if you're kind of active in, a, in an area where you want to work together with these other websites. And if you're kind of like constantly battling them and just saying, well, it's my right to link to you however I feel like it, and at the same time, you're kind of asking for a favor somewhere else, then I imagine that's not going to be the healthiest relationship. So, Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right, some more questions from the Q&A. Is it OK to have an image video and a web sitemap in one XML file? Sure. You can do that. That's absolutely no problem. Uh, is there any way of using the Webmaster Tools API to download top search queries, keywords, and top link pages for sites? And I read the API can't be used this way. Can you confirm? Is there an alternative way to download this data? At the moment, you can use uh, the Python script to download that data. Um, that's something that will end up in the API, I'm guessing, in the upcoming quarters. So not immediately, but uh, Probably later this year, you'll also have access to the search query information within the API. 
And for that, of course, we also need to make sure that we have the whole search analytics feature launch first. So it's it kind of waiting on that as well. Um, a couple pages popped up in Webmaster Tools showing as non-mobile friendly for one of my sites during March was previously shown no problem pages. But when I check them with a the mobile friendly test, they show as OK. Why might this be? This is something where you kind of have to take a look at the current tests and figure out what's actually happening in there. It might be that maybe some CSS or JavaScript files were disavowed back then. It might just be that at the time when we checked your site, we couldn't crawl it properly. Maybe there are some things that timed out. So if, for example, your CSS or your JavaScript files timed out when we crawled it back then, and they're working now normally, and your server is kind of fine now, then that's something that will just get picked up as we recrawl those pages normally. So that's not necessarily something I'd worry about. Um, our website can't be crawled by Googlebot due to 100% DNS errors. Robots text can't be found. No changes were made to the robots text. There's no HD access. Bing Webmaster tools can crawl the site. Uh, other DNS tools say everything is fine. What could be wrong? Usually, this means that your DNS server is somehow blocking Googlebot. And often, that's based on the IP address, for example. Uh, so that's something where you might want to double check uh, your DNS provider to see if they're blocking Googlebot in any way, or if you have a chance to try an alternate DNS provider uh, for your website to see if that works better. That might be an option there as well. Uh, the robots text not found message there might be a little bit misleading because it's not necessarily that we're trying to find that file. I mean, we are trying to find that robots text file. And that's just the first URL that we try to crawl when we go to a website. So if we can't even get to the robots text file, then that's something where probably something pretty basic on your server is blocking us from being able to access your site. So it's not necessarily that the robots text file is a problem, but just that we can't get to your site at all. And the robots text file happens to be the first one we, that we try to pick up. Uh, by the way, John, the user actually, uh, the question actually says that the robots text file can be found. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter if the file exists or not. If we don't get any reply at all, if we can't do the DNS lookup at all for that host name, then that's essentially something where we, we can't get anything back for that request. We, we can't even start to crawl normally there. Um, how bad are software for errors due to switching to SSL? Uh, I don't know. It's Your site shouldn't have soft 404 errors from switching to SSL. That sounds like something might be configured incorrectly. Essentially, if you're switching to SSL, the first step you do is make sure that it works on both variations, uh, with HTTPS and without HTTPS. Usually, there is a bit of work involved with the HTTPS version to make sure all embedded content works well under HTTPS so that you don't have the mixed content warnings. And once you have that set up properly, you could do a redirect to the HTTPS version or set the rel canonical first. Um, but either way, you shouldn't really have soft 404 errors for that. That sounds like something else might be kind of misconfigured. Uh, looks like Webmaster Tools is getting broken links from scraper sites when using bad regex to determine if it's in a sitemap. Um, for example, something with an umlaut in it. Um, we do try to pick up all kinds of links that we can find. And sometimes the links that we pick up are broken. So a common example that we see is someone will copy and paste the link into a forum. The forum software will truncate that link and show like the first part of the URL and then dot, 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 and then some of the rest of the URL as well. And if we just see the text version of that link, then we'll think, well, these dot, dot, dots in the middle might be a part of the normal URL. And we'll try to crawl it like that. And we'll see that there's a 404 there. And then we'll say, well, fine, OK, so this URL didn't work. We'll try the next ones. So this is something where you see the results of those 404s in Webmaster Tools. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem there that you need to fix. That might just be like we found these links. We tried them out. They didn't work. 
and fine, we move on to the next link. So it's not something you have to fix. It's not something where you have to go to other people's websites and say, hey, you have a bad link somewhere on your page. You need to fix that. That's essentially us just saying, well, we'd love to pick up more content from your website. We found this link that we hadn't heard of before. We tried it out. It didn't work. Fine. We just want to let you know about it. Um, how does Google pick one website app to suggest as install app in between the 10 blue links? What if I don't want to install that app? And every time I search in the same market and find the same website app suggested to me by Google, will it be user friendly or won't it? Um, I don't know the exact criteria that we use to show the, the install app button in the search results. We, we do try to pick up the ones that we think are relevant to show to users. And oftentimes, if you get the same data through an app, you have a kind of a nicer experience. There are some nicer things that you can do with the app. So I don't really uh, think that's something that we turn off completely. But uh, it's still fairly new. So I'm sure any kind of feedback that you can send back to us uh, in the search results with a feedback link are, will be very appreciated by people. So if you find this annoying and you really don't want to see that app anymore, then let us know about that so that we can kind of uh, find a solution there for you as well. And this is something where I imagine over time you'll see a lot of iterations and changes still happening. Sometimes it'll be, I don't know, nicer. Sometimes there might be things that you don't really appreciate. So feedback is always welcome. Hi, John. Sure. Yeah, uh, question. So uh, I understood that the uh, this mobile ranking uh, change is not going to be, uh, is not yet going to include the website speed as a direct ranking factor. So, but currently uh, there is uh, at least uh, some of the uh, website speed is a factor, um, at least for the especially slow sites. And then we see this data in webmaster tools. So is that uh, an average, um, like the crawl data, the time spent downloading a page by Googlebot? Is that an average between, uh, I mean, Google, uh, the mobile bot, and and the uh, the regular Google bot are not going to be uh, coming up with the same speeds. Um, so. That's actually something different. So that's a common point of confusion, I guess. Um, on, on the one hand, what we look for, or what, what we look for in that, uh, that blog post, I don't know, it must be four or five years back in the meantime, uh, is how long it takes to actually render the page in a browser. So if you enter the URL, how long it takes for you to actually see the content directly in the browser. And that's something that I think is always worth working on, even if it's currently not a ranking factor. I know there are lots of really neat tricks out there to make uh, mobile-friendly sites really fast and snappy. And from what I've heard from other people, that if you have a really fast mobile-friendly website or really fast website in general, then people will spend more time on your website kind of clicking around, getting to know more about your website, about your business, about your product. So that's something where you kind of have this indirect effect in any case, even if there's no SEO effect right away. Uh, the other part you're talking about is the crawl time in Webmaster Tools. And that's the time it takes for us to download the URLs directly. So that's not taking into account any rendering. That's essentially just raw downloading the HTML page, raw downloading the images, any kind of content that you have in there. And that's the average time that you see there. Usually, where the difference comes in is that you might have a really fast server, but you have so many different things that are embedded within the page that you're actually still rendering the page very slowly. So that's something where you have a kind of a disconnect between a fast server on the one hand, but the way your HTML pages are structured makes them extremely slow on, on a variety of devices. On the other hand, you might have a relatively slow server, but maybe you have your HTML set up in a way that's really efficient, 
that means that these pages still render really quickly. So those are kind of the, the two variations there. Uh, for us, the time to crawl a page kind of drives how many URLs we can crawl from our server at any given time, where if your server is really fast and snappy and always returns the URLs really quickly, then we can crawl a lot more than if your server is really slow. So that's especially if you have a website that uh, lives on kind of current events, things that are happening quickly that need to be found and searched fairly quickly, then if you have a slow server, then chances are we're going to have a hard time keeping up with those news. On the other hand, if you have a really fast server, then we can crawl those a lot faster. So the crawling speed is more of a technical issue for Googlebot, and the rendering time is more of a kind of a uh, user experience issue for users um, come not like the Google bots. So those are kind of the two two sides of that coin. Okay, so that the uh, indexing is, uh, I mean, is is mostly uh, what what that's about. Uh, so is is uh, there a a ranking factor? Um, that is that includes. I mean, is isn't there that includes rendering time or not? I mean, um, that's just too much data. I don't know how much of that is actually still used at the moment. So we we do say we have a small factor in there for pages that are really slow to load, where we take that into account. But I don't know how how much that's actually still a problem in practice. So I mean, we've seen pages speed up a lot. I think over time we'll find that maybe mobile-friendly pages are technically they can load on a mobile device, but they're actually really really slow. Maybe we have to kind of encourage people to speed things up there as well. But I think at the moment this is something where. I'd focus more on the user aspect there, where if you can make users happy by having a really snappy and fast website that renders quickly, then they're going to do a lot more on your website. They're going to hang around a lot longer just because it's a lot less involved for them to try things out. If they can click on different options, different categories within your website, and they get the results essentially immediately, then they're going to try a lot more things there. Like you know, um, seconds. Yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of studies done out there, especially by Amazon, who has done a, a ton of experiments around this. And I think they've published a lot of information about this, where they artificially slow things down just a couple hundred milliseconds and even see that there's a significant impact on what people actually do on a website there. And if you're talking about a website where you're currently really slow in rendering pages, and you can go from, I don't know, maybe 10 seconds a page to one second a page rendering time, then that's something where I'm, I'm almost certain you'll see a drastic change in the way users react within your website. And with that, of course, they'll pass that on to other people. They'll recommend your website more and say, hey, if you want more information about this topic, this website works great because you can get everything really quickly. So that's something where there'll be a really strong kind of indirect effect there that you can work with as well. Uh, by the way, John, regarding crawling, uh, I noticed for one of the websites that we work with, uh, we use the crawler to try to go over the whole website. And after like a minute of crawling, maybe because of the speed, uh, the CMS or maybe the hosting uh, server, I'm not sure, uh, started throwing out 508 errors, unused. Uh, I'm not sure uh, why is that. I, I was just wondering if Google might interpret that uh, problematically, like uh, those pages not existing, or whether just uh, knowing and slowing down the crawl rate and all. Yeah, so what we would do in a case like that, if we're crawling a website and we see, run across a bunch of server errors, like 5, 8, 500s, 508s, whatever, then usually we'll just slow down. So we'll see, well, there's a rise in server errors where we crawl like this. Therefore, tomorrow we'll crawl a little bit less. And that might be from one day to the next. It might take a couple days for us to pick that up automatically. But that's something that our systems essentially do automatically. They'll try to fine tune the crawling rate that works best for your server 
without causing problems on your server. Because it doesn't make sense for us to crawl so much that your users can't use your website. It doesn't make sense to crawl so much that we slow down your server, that we cause server errors. We want to kind of find that, that magic crawl rate that works well for us to pick up your new content, but at the same time also not cause any problems. Mm -hmm. Um, would you suggest to block tag pages in robots text? I use a lot of tags to group my tutorials for my e-readers. Is that duplicate content and so on or bad for my website? Uh, this really kind of depends on your website, the kind of site that you have. I think there's some kinds of tag pages that are essentially going to search results pages, which probably don't make sense to get indexed. There are other kinds of tag pages that are almost like category pages where you have a useful collection of top of individual pieces of content that match this category. And that might be something you do want to have indexed. So that's not something where I'd say there's a default answer that works well for everyone. You kind of have to work that out for your website yourself. Look at some of those sample pages and be as objective as you can and say, well, is this really something I want to have indexed, or is this something I don't really need to have indexed like that? John, uh, just a quick question regarding the mobile update. And I know, I know, I know that uh, you guys said many times that it doesn't affect the search results. But uh, if uh, the site's, like, basically a very busy site, you know, if 50% is mobile traffic and that website has not adjusted uh, you know, to the mobile update, can it affect the search results somehow? Not, I understand the desktop, it won't affect, it won't affect, but like, you know, if there's less traffic coming to the site, and not too much on desktop, then that's it, right? I mean, because it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really hard to say. I don't think there is a, a full answer that I can give you there. It, it kind of depends on, on the website, I guess, how people are going to this website. Um, if they're using search to go to the, the website, if they're searching for something generic and landing on the website, uh, what they're doing afterwards. If they're on a mobile phone and they want to recommend it to others, is this something that they wouldn't do because they don't see it in search? It, it really kind of depends on the website. So that's something where if you do see that you have a lot of traffic from mobile and your website doesn't work well on mobile, then even outside of search, you'd probably want to fix that problem, right? right. You, don't, you don't want to say, well, 80% of my people are coming through mobile, but I don't want to serve them something that works for their devices. That's not not really a long-term strategy, regardless of what you think that happens. In Just that that person is old school and he doesn't want to make that a uh, you know uh, switch and you know. I'm sure there's thousands and millions of people out there that are like that, but, you know, I did say that, and I told them to make that uh, switch, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is something where not everyone wants to do that switch now. Maybe they're also saying, well, I have a lot of investments planned for, for the spring, and I want to save my money for, I don't know, other things to invest in my business to make sure that it really works well. And maybe in the fall, I have more time to actually work on my marketing, my website, those kind of things. That's perfectly fine. I mean, your website isn't going to be removed from search just because it's not mobile friendly. If people are searching for your business, they'll still find your business. So it's not something where there's like, I don't know, a hidden hammer coming down on your website and you're going to disappear from search forever. It's when you're ready, we'll be able to kind of take that into account. And until then, maybe you'll see a drop in mobile traffic to your website. Maybe that's that's fine with you. Maybe that's not something you, you're really worried about at the moment. Maybe you have bigger problems. Okay. All right. Uh, we just have a few minutes left, so I'll just open it up to, to you all. Uh, just a quick one, John. Uh, I sent you an email last week regarding uh, some image uh, spammy websites that were kind of um, using uh, hotlinking images from uh, normal websites, and they were appearing in image search. Uh, I don't know if you got it and whether you managed to take a look. Um, for, for those kind of things, I generally try to submit a spam report so that uh, the website team is aware of that. Um, I 
can we pass your email out as well so that they, they kind of have those details too? Okay, yeah, I, I sent you some examples. I didn't know if, if, if it went straight to your spam folder because I mentioned some of the spam websites there. I get a lot of weird emails, don't worry. Cool. Okay. Okay. Uh, John. Yes. Uh, so when the mobile friendly tags uh, uh, first started getting used, was that a significant um, change as far as uh, user reception, um, increased uh, click-throughs from mobile users uh, using that? Or um, would you say, say it wasn't that big a difference? It's, it's really hard to say because these things always take time for people to understand what they actually need. And that's not something where we, we can put out something and say, well, this is mobile friendly and people will understand it right away. They might assume this means something slightly different or they might be kind of confused by the label and they don't really know what to do with that. Um, I know before that we also showed various icons in the search results where we'd say, I don't know, a green mobile phone or a red mobile phone or a crossed out mobile phone to try to see which of these variations kind of brought the message across best. And that's something where we noticed it was very, very widely varying reception from users where in the beginning they'd be totally confused and not really know what this means. It's like, well, will I call someone on my phone? Or what, what does like the green or the red mean? What does the crossed out phone mean? But we noticed that sometimes it just takes time for these things to get picked up by users and to be figured out. So that's something where we didn't really expect <clears throat> anything to happen from one day to the next to say, well, the click-through rate will double for these sites because, of course, everyone will figure it out. Um, a lot of you SEO experts who have been looking at this area for a long time, you probably figured out a little bit faster than the, the average user, but the normal user doesn't like read Google's blogs, they just use their phone and they see the search results, and they see this label, and they don't really know where this is actually coming from. So it ta always takes a bit of time for things to get understood by the normal user, but I think that's, that's something that's part of the normal process and part of the reasons we do so many experiments as well to see which of these experiments uh, are easier picked up by users, which of these are more complicated and harder to be understood by the average user. Uh, would you say that the uh, mobile-friendly implementations over the last couple of months has been uh, as high as expected? Um, you know, uh, very good numbers or, you know, compared with, like, the SSL change where the, you know not so many people may have really seen the value um, we we've seen some some nice rises in the number of mobile sites that are out there so that's something where the, the effect is definitely positive in that we're encouraging more people to make really nice mobile friendly sites so I think that from that point of view it's it's working out fairly well. I don't think we have any numbers that we can share on that, though. So it's not that I can say, well, I don't know. 10% more of the web is now mobile friendly. I, mm. I don't think we have any numbers like that. Well, the word is out today, because it's on all the uh, big uh, international news channels. Bloomberg, CNN. Yeah, it's, it's everywhere. I, I think it's. It's interesting that uh, we, we have so much coverage about these. Uh, I'm kind of sad that uh, there's a, a strong negative focus on this as well, where, like, I don't know, businesses are disappearing because of this change, and not so much people realizing, well, this makes things for everyone who's been using a mobile phone who's trying to use the Internet on the phone, and that's a really large number of people, and that's a number that's growing and growing. So that's something where I think... People are going to have to get used to the new reality of a lot of people using their mobile phone as a primary internet device. Right. But, I mean, people still using desktop. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I was on vacation last 
I don't know, five days or so, and I had my laptop with me. I didn't open it once. I was able to do everything with my phone, and that's, I think, where, where things are headed. You might have a desktop. You might still use a desktop for some things, but a lot of the browsing that you do nowadays, you can do it on the phone. It just works just as well. Uh, by the way, John, since you mentioned the rollout will be over the next week or so, uh, is it going to be at the same time internationally, or the US or English based websites will see some of the changes first, and maybe international queries and results will be affected later? This is globally. So this is happening at the same time globally. All right. Um, thank you all for joining. Thanks for all the questions and discussions. Um, I'll have the next Hangout in English, I think, on Friday. So depending on your time zone, maybe we'll see you there. Otherwise, in one of the next ones as well. Have a great week, everyone. And good luck with your mobile-friendly websites. Thanks, John. Have a great Thanks, week. John. Thanks, John. Bye. Bye, everyone. Take care.